great innovation stories make change possible. Each week on the Innovation Storytellers podcast, I invite innovation leaders to share how they overcame the obstacles to introduce breakthrough ideas to the world through the power of story. I'm featuring guests from Tesla, TD Ameritrade, Corning, Cisco, Bloomberg, and so many more. Listen in to learn how you can tell a more effective innovation story and change the future for the better. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Innovation Storytellers. I'm excited to have someone I'd refer to as maybe the godfather of innovation for things that you know of, things behind the scenes, and also some innovations that may or may not have made it to the market finish line. But perhaps another finish line that's equally important for all of us innovators, which is failure. Can we embrace the big F? Today, we're going to be talking about why some innovations get there and why they don't, and the stories that accompany those innovations on both fronts. So let me first introduce you to Lon Safko. He is the president and CEO of Innovative Thinking, an incredible consultancy that helps people, that helps innovators get those products and services to their finish line. He is an innovator and a futurist, and he doesn't just guess at what might happen. Lon knows what's coming and how to take advantage of it. He is also a best-selling author of the Social Media Bible, which I highly recommend, and hit number one on Amazon, as well as the Fusion Marketing Bible, which hit number three on Amazon as a top 10 bestseller, and is also an acclaimed international keynote speaker and trainer. And you may know Lon from the PBS television special, Social Media and You, communicating in a digital Lon created the first computer to save a human life, as coined by Steve Jobs, and has 18 inventions and more than 30,000 of his personal records as part of the permanent collection of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. So, Lon, welcome to Innovation Storytellers. Thank you so much for being a guest today. Oh, it's an honor. This is an awesome podcast. Thank you for considering me. Oh, we're thrilled. We're thrilled. So I ask everyone who comes on the podcast, first and foremost, how did you get here? Because none of us majored in innovation in college, right? That doesn't even exist because as soon as the curriculum is written, it's out of date. So, <laughs> so has is this the mind of an innovator? Do you feel like you were always that kid who knew what was coming next? Yeah, I was, I was born in a very early age. And I immediately we're born realized, at an early age. <laughs> it's like the rest of us. <laughs> and I realized that I was not like the rest of us, maybe like you, innovative. Yeah, early on, I was uh, taking my toys apart rather than playing with them to see how they worked. And it frustrated my parents. And I was kicked out of Catholic school in third grade because I was well, let's just say too innovative (laughs) for that environment. So yeah. And then finally, I'm actually a civil engineer. I knew that I had to have a real job and I I, I practiced it for three years and I've never done it since. Because during that time, I realized I really was an innovator and I had to do other things. I couldn't work a nine to five job. So my entire career, I've basically worked for myself, coming up with new ideas And as you said, bringing them to market, either to watch them succeed or watch their terrible failures. I love how you were a disruptor from the third grade on. That's really uh, (laughs) impressive before the term was really even coined for people in business, right? (laughs) Disruptor is a good way to put it. They used other words at the time. (laughs) (laughs) Those nuns can be quite severe. Wow, they're tough. (laughs) So take us back from the beginning, Lon. So you started off as a civil engineer at some point, right? You either got the, I'm out or I'm fired, right? I know I love quoting Mike Bloomberg when someone said, how did you know you wanted to be an entrepreneur? And he said, I heard those famous two words, you're fired. (laughs) Honest (laughs) to goodness, (laughs) the only time I've ever taken real jobs that's how they inevitably always ended. <laughs> You're fired. So I had to realize that there was a trend, there was a pattern happening here. But it, it actually was when I first started to go to college right out of high school, there was a new technology. What was it called? Oh, yeah, computers. 
and nobody knew what to do with them. And yeah, we were doing word processing. We thought that was awesome. So I took a TI-99 handheld and I started programming it for civil engineering. I taught myself how to program. And the wait, next wait, thing I TI-99. For those of us who don't know what a <laughs> TI-99 is, it's not a new light beer of just 99 calories. That's something different. <laughs> That's a handheld computer. It looks like a calculator. This one is a Casio. Yeah, I don't have a TI, but this uh-huh. is, at the time, it was as powerful as any computer on earth. Mm. And what so year I, would that, was that, Lon? Uh, 75. 75. 1975. Mm-hmm. And I started creating all of the software, coordinate geometry, earthwork computation, traffic light analysis, and I had this huge library and all this in- engineering companies heard that I had it and they would be able to use my software on something as small as this and get the correct answer instantly rather than spending hours and possibly making a mistake. So I began selling the software to Westchester County and New York State and all the civil engineers. And I was like, wow, you know, this is really fun to come up with an idea and then bring it to fruition. And I could make money <laughs> in my spare time. What do you know? And that's how entrepreneurship came and bit you on the butt, right? So that's exactly what happened. And it was a computer that eventually led me into most of the rest of my career. It really was a path, even though it looks like I, I have ADD. I was tested for it because I thought I might have because uh-huh. I'm all over the board. Well, owning a computer in 75, 6, 7, we got into the Apple II, and I taught myself how to program that. And the next thing I said, wouldn't it be cool if I could write a piece of software where I can have a communication back and forth? I can talk to the computer, type it in. It could talk back to me, put it up on the display, and we could have a conversation. Well, I created that. It's called Let's Talk. And in retrospect, turned out to be the world's first chat bot. Mm, <laughs> wow. What year was this? That was 1978. The world's first chatbot. How many of us had a platform upon which we could see said chatbot? Well, all my websites now actually have chatbots. Sure, sure. No, but I mean, in 1975, when you think about the application, who would have been your user for the chatbot you invented? You know what? I sold it to just gamers because they thought it was really cool. Other than that, because there was no internet, there was no distribution. Uh, It was just a novelty. So effectively, the walkie-talkie for the computer. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. Uh Then I thought in 1978, wow, wouldn't it be totally awesome if I can get the computer to talk, to actually sound out what I'm typing? And I did. By the end of 1978, the computer was actually speaking back to me, which I thought was totally cool. I could type something in and it would talk to me, kind of like uh, Star Trek and some of the other fictitious uses of computers. So I kept working on it and took me a good number four, at least four more years. Mm -hmm. I said, wouldn't it be great if it could understand my voice? So I teamed up with a a Texas Instrument engineer and I wrote the software and we used the voice synthesizing board in reverse. And I'll be darned, it recognized my voice. So now I could sit down in front of my computer in 1979, 81 there and say, good morning. And the computer would say, good morning. How are you? Who am I speaking with? And I'd say, Lon. And it would say, oh, welcome back, Lon. How are you today? So Lon, when you're developing these technologies, right? And it's 1979, just out of curiosity, what kind of computer are you on? At the time, well, it it was a Franklin. It was a knockoff of the Apple II because it was less expensive. Mm. And then eventually I switched over to the Apple II and then developed that until the Macintosh came out and then moved it over to the Macintosh platform. Wow. So there was already an Apple II in 1979. Yes. Wow. Yeah, it actually came out in late 76, 77. And by 78, they started to become popular. And I bought my first one in 79. I mean, popular among a very select group of people. Right? <laughs> I mean, I remember my n- neighbor going to Radio Shack. Yeah, the TRS-80. TRS-80, exactly. So (laughs) that's what he was operating on. But that giant thing with the screen that was only green. Green. (laughs) The letters were green and uh, developing simple one-line commands of code and uh, if-then statements and stuff like that, or maybe it would make a design. But you were creating voice-enabled programming already on a Franklin. Yeah, I had a whopping 16K of memory. (laughs) Woohoo! Wow! <laughs> and a cassette recorder to store it. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I love it. I love it. So did, when did the idea of kind of commercializing some of these either take off or die? So t- walk us through that process. And I, of course, want to get to what's tucked away in the Smithsonian as well. Well, this is the path. This is how I got to that. Well, I, again, in the late 70s, early 80s, I had, I, again, in retrospect, I invented the first voice recognition and verse, first voice synthesizing in the first chatbot. Accidentally, mm-hmm. just because I thought it would be cool and never got credit for it because nobody's ever asked the question who invented the first. So I continue to do that. And then about 1984, I said, wow, wouldn't it be awesome if I can get it to control my environment? Wow, if I can get it to turn on a light and answer my phone and lock my door and adjust my heating. So (laughs) I started working with little relays and I wasn't an electrical engineer, but I got it to answer the phone and make a telephone call. And then I went to work while I found X10 Powerhouse, which was the first little modules for home automation. Mm -hmm. And they were about ready to go out of business. So I worked with them, wrote the software, and then they started to succeed. I used that technology. So by 1984, 85, I had a computer system where I can say lamp on, lamp off, television on, call mom, lock door. So you were already inventing smart home technology. Again, nobody's asked who, but I, to this day, can't find anybody who invented smart home before me. Wow. And so, I mean, this is prior to Internet of Things. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Internet of Things only really just kind of popped out in the last three, four years and became popular. And the Internet didn't even exist at that point for more than a decade. So how did you create the connectivity for these smart home features? Yeah, you know, it was really cool. It was just a little box about this big. Uh And you plugged it in and you plug in your lamp or whatever you want. And it would use closed circuit radio signals, not through the air, because I don't want to screw around with the FCC. But if I put them through the wiring of the house, I, I didn't have to get any licenses. So the computer would send it out through its power cord into the house, find one of 255 boxes, and it would turn it on, turn it off, dim it, or whatever I asked it to do in the computer. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> no. So I, yeah, I, actually, it was the first Internet of Things, too, if you really want to stretch the definition. Uh, yeah, with no internet. That's really what made the internet of things difficult. Because <laughs> all so, I had was of things. So talk us through a little bit, Lon, about the stories that you told that you hoped would gain market penetration. But correct me if I'm wrong, these incredible innovations didn't really take hold, right, in our collective conscious. We weren't using these on a regular basis when you invented Absolutely. And people, especially the hospitals, and I'll tell you how I got to the hospitals with this, I would demonstrate and everybody was ooh and ah and excited and, oh my God, we've never seen a computer do that before. And then they go to lunch because they couldn't wrap their brain around how they could actually apply this technology and why it was so important. And even though I kept telling everybody, this is going to change your life. Mm. And nobody, they smiled at me and they're like, poor Lon, he thinks that way and we humor him. But the reality is that right now in our pockets, now after 30 years, everybody's finally embraced those three technologies, home automation, voice recognition, voice synthesizing, and to some extent chatbots. So what do you think was missing? The problem I've always had is that I can see things usually between five and 30 years before they're going to happen. I've tried to narrow that down. Believe it or not, it, 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 you would think it'd be awesome if you could see 30 years into the future. No, that's a curse. That's just a waste of time. So what I try to do now is only look five years into the future so that I can let society kind of catch up with a lot of my ideas. So one of the worst ideas, well, I thought it was a good idea. In 2001, 2002, I was a professional speaker. So if you wanted to get a gig, you'd have to take these giant half-inch VHS tapes and put them in a big padded envelope and mail them out to a client or mail six of them to a speaker's bureau. And they'd have a big room, a warehouse where they would have those and send them to their client. It was a mess. Well, in 2001, a movie, the, the Apple's movie came out, what's it called? Uh, uh, Quick time. And uh-huh. I thought, wow, what if we could eliminate distributing these giant VHS tapes and just make 
iMovies out of all of them. And we can, the internet now had been out for six years. So I created a co company called Digital Rights Management. And I started contacting the 35,000 speakers in the United States. And every one of them just, oh, pr they practically hung up on me. We're not going to put it so other people can see them. We, the clients, if they look at ours, they're going to look at our competitors and they're going to go with our competitors. We'll never do that. And I tried for a better part of a year to convince them it would be a good idea. Absolutely not. <clears throat> it wasn't for at least another six, seven years before everybody took their information and became digital and put it up on websites exactly the way I described it. So mm -hmm. after all that time and money, the company failed. Wow. <laughs> and so this is the part where I want to get this right, because... This show is called Innovation Storytellers, and there are those who have come on the show who have talked about really being ahead of their time. And part of that is that our human brains need incremental innovation. As much as we love a moonshot, it's very hard for us as humans to kind of take those leaps, even when they're made available to us. And I Beautiful. think your experience bears that out. What do you think happened both from an innovation standpoint, i.e. what were the incremental steps that the market needed to understand before getting there? And then what was the accompanying story that you think, if in hindsight now, could have been told differently that would make adoption easier for your target markets? Yeah, that was beautifully put. Obviously, you really do understand innovation. That was very well put. It's incremental steps. And if you try to skip those incremental steps, which is also associated with time increments, you're going to lose because you can't. You have to take them by the hand one step at a time. And I'm talking about society as a whole, not me and not, certainly not you. So what could I have done different? What was the problem? Well, what happened after 2001, in 2001, we didn't know what to do with the internet. It, it Everybody who created a website, every company, just put their brochure. They had an electronic version of a brochure, and they just put that up there. And that was their website because nobody knew what else to do. We well, called what, it brochureware. But yes, that's exactly brochureware. That's <laughs> exactly it. Yeah, you old enough to have been there. Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> I started marketing and tech at um, Internet 1.0 during the dot-com boom. Okay, right after the 2000s. Yeah, well, uh, probably 98 is when I got started. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you had the fun of being invested in the boom. Yes, when we thought it would never end. <laughs> Banner advertising, you're kidding me? That's a gold mine. That's a gold mine. <laughs> Who doesn't want to click on a blinking banner ad? <laughs> Pretty much everyone. <laughs> There's another great story that ended up in failure. So what happened was we didn't know what to do with it, but Apple was always on the cutting edge of, especially with uh media, creating video and audio. And they did a great job with uh, QuickTime. And it, they, the compression rates were good enough now because the early internet was extremely slow. So until then, we couldn't have done that. But from that point, we could. Now, the mindset wasn't there because nobody had seen it done. So they, <clears throat> what they immediately do is jump back to pre-technology thinking. That's what I found. So if you try to say you need a word processor, they're going to say, no, my electric typewriter works great. You always jump back to pre-technology. So when I'm talking about distributing video over the internet, they jump back to this pre-technology, back to the VHS tapes and say, no, I just send out the tapes and I can reproduce them. And they sit on a shelf and sit on their desk. So it's a reminder. They had all these excuses. So they didn't want to hear why it was more efficient. And then if you actually created a site that had a lot of speakers, a lot of people would come to it and you wouldn't necessarily lose your client to a competitor, but it took a lot of incremental steps before people realize that. And that that piece is so important. I was listening to another speaker, so fascinating. And he showed a picture of a Model T Ford that was being pulled by a horse. <laughs> <laughs> That's and, great. That know, says it all right there. Right. When asked, why is a horse pulling your car, sir? And he said, well, I always want to have a backup and I want to make sure the horse is trained and doesn't get scared. <laughs> And so he alternatively put gas in the car and drove it that way. And when not, had the horse pull it. And I just thought, <laughs> this is how we enter innovation. And I've used Kicking it. and screaming. <laughs> yes. And I've used this example on the show before. I was moving. And so I was cleaning out lots of boxes from inside the cabinet and found a box of old floppy disks. <laughs> 
And I showed it to my son and I said, Hey, my thesis is saved on this floppy disk. He's like, and he kind of looked at it and (laughs) said, why would you 3d print a copy of the save icon? (laughs) That's that's priceless. And I like, it was so full circle and I just looked at him and it was like, yes, that's what your mother's been doing. She's been 3d printing in secret. A copy of the save icon just to baffle you, my son. <laughs> that is what I'm doing. That is so <laughs> wonderful because they had no clue about the evolution. And I adore my son. And he is a lovely tech nerd as well. He went to the Rochester Institute of Technology. And wow, he's yet, brilliant. And yet this is not <laughs> part of the day-to-day of his understanding of tech. We have gone so far afield, right, that we need to use we need to use this very antiquated technology as a symbol of how to save. Now, meanwhile, my son's impression of how we save things really doesn't even exist anymore because thanks to Office 365, we're in a constant state of saving. You don't have to go back and save your work. And it's It's a cloud, you'll never see it. It's always saving, right? (laughs) So even this concept, when I look at it on my computer now, like, I wonder what the rest of the world thinks right now that we're in 2022, what that little icon actually represents. That's funny because it's there. Everyone sees it, but I'll bet they don't know what it represents is right. What is that? What is that but thing? They'll recognize it in the heartbeat, but they'll never really understand why. Where it came from. Yeah. And so our mental iconography, right, and the symbols that we use are part of the innovation process to get people to understand the innovation story. Yeah. But there's a reason that we call it email is because all of us understand what mail is. And so it's far less threatening to put an E on the front of it than come up with transatlantic underwater cable-based <laughs> communication, you know, that we're trying to send this message from London to New York through an underwater cable. And that gets back to the proper storytelling. That's right. Yeah, so I you- like that. So when you think, I mean, these are the verbal cues, right? These are the, this is how semiotics work is that we think about how do I actually create a bridge from my concept of where I am today to this thing that lives in the future? And what are the breadcrumbs that I need to leave for my audience in order for them to reach five years, 10 years, 30 years out? Right. Because we cannot make the mental leap. And the other thing that's happening inside of our bodies is that we are creating cortisol in the moment that we ask people to accept change or c- to embrace a new concept. <laughs> Sometime adrenaline. And that too, <laughs> right? It's the feeling of being inside of a scary movie because we don't know what's coming next. It's like the and top of a roller coaster. Right. Click. <laughs> and so our job as interviewers, I mean, as innovators, is to help them take the linguistic step, the visual step, all of the five senses so that it's not so terrifying and that the future isn't feeling like an unknown, but rather it feels like they are part of that new future. That's beautiful. So when you think about now these, like when you went to that hospital and you brought them this technology, what do you think the story needed to be? <laughs> yeah, to get back to that, which is is one of the best stories in, in my career, to just camp on what you just said. After uh, the Macintosh had been out for a year, 1985, <clears throat> what I did is I create, I recreated the entire, it was called Soft Voice. Mm. And our industry loves concatenation, so it was software control or voice controlled software. <clears throat> but then I changed it to Sensei when it moved over to the Macintosh, Master Teacher, because mm. I wanted to expand it. And what I did was, is because the, Mac, uh, the Macintosh was graphic, I had the opportunity to use graphics as opposed to text on the older machines. So right. what I did is I created this room, this environment, and an, on a de- and there was a desk in the foreground, and there was a telephone and a spreadsheet on the desk, and a, t- uh, a typewriter. Again, over my desk, I said, always revert to pre-technology metaphors when designing my software. So if you wanted to type a letter, people didn't know or were afraid of the word processing, <clears throat> but they certainly knew what a typewriter did. Mm-hmm. And if you wanted to make a phone call, it was it's easy. You click on the phone. Or if you wanted to read a book, you click on the bookshelf. You wanted to control the light, you'd click on the ceiling fan. So everything that I did <clears throat> was this environment that you could move around in and access its capabilities by using these old fashioned images that everyone was comfortable with, which again, by accident, 
back in 1985, I created the world's first virtual reality. Wow. And what year was that, Lon? <laughs> <laughs> that was 1985. And about five years after that, I got a call from Dr. Thomas Furness. Thomas Furness was uh, at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base for a decade, working with 18 PhDs and spent billions of dollars developing virtual reality for the F-15 jet fighters. And they would paint the cockpits black so you couldn't see. And then just using radar and LIDAR and some of the other technology, the pilot was able to see a virtual representation of the world below them and actually navigate these jets, even though they couldn't see outside. <clears throat> and it had voice recognition and voice synthesizing. I didn't know any of that. That was all top secret at the time. And he contacted me and asked me to please meet him at the University of uh, Washington in Washington State in Seattle, which I did, and <laughs> which was an amazing. So here's Dr. Thomas Furness, who's credited with creating the first virtual reality system, and then also was an attorney. But the gentleman sitting immediately to my right was Bill Gates, senior. Wow. Dad, because they were looking at possibly investing. And we started the meeting with Thomas Furness saying, I had to meet you because I've been working on this for a decade with 18 PhDs. And the cheapest system I got is over $5 million. And the system that you showed me just now does everything that mine does for $2,500. How the hell did you do that? Holy moly. <laughs> True story. <laughs> and so once again, we find ourselves sometimes even in a state of disbelief, right? When we're bringing, well, there's so many interesting things about this. I love the idea that you know, innovation is happening simultaneously across so many different frequencies, because I really do believe that innovation exists on some kind of vibratory level where great minds are thinking like they're tapping into a particular zeitgeist at the same time, mm -hmm. right? It's no accident that Bill Gates' dad was thinking about the same things you were thinking about because the context and the time had arisen where it became needed. And as yes. a result, it comes to life, right? Yes. And I had a track record of saving people's lives with this technology by working with quadriplegics who wanted to, well, let me just tell you that story that actually started me. So I had this and I was, it was the Christmas of uh, 85, <clears throat> the week between New Year's and Christmas. And I was sitting in, I was managing an Apple computer store in Kennewick, Washington. And I was playing with the computer and I was actually drawing a wreath. I'd say up left, green, up right, red. And I was just talking to the computer. I was drawing this Christmas wreath in colors. And this guy come up behind me in the showroom and says, what are you doing? I said, I'm just talking to my computer. He goes, what do you, I've never seen anybody talk to a computer before. I said, well, let me show you. And I said, I can even turn on the lights. I said, watch, I'll do that. And I, he goes, don't you realize that there's 48 and a half million quadriplegics in America that if they want a light on, they got to scream for help. They've never been able to turn on a light since their accident. And most of them are trying to commit suicide. I was like, Whoa, you got my attention. Wow, Lon. So he set up this meeting with this engineer. He was uh, late 40s, I think 48 years old. And he had a friend who was a quadriplegic. He was perfectly abled. And he mm. invited him over 1984, no, 85 for Thanksgiving. And when dinner was over, he was wheeling his friend down the front steps of his home in Yakima, Washington. And he lost his balance with the wheelchair. The wheelchair went forward. He held on to it, flipped up over the chair, came down, hit the base of his neck right on the edge of the step, snapped his neck and became a C2 quadriplegic. Wow. He woke up in the hospital. His insurance had run out. It cost about $3.5 million to rehabilitate an injury victim. And the insurance ran out at a million bucks. So they had to move him to a charitable hospital. He was an engineer, couldn't use his arms. So he lost his job. They fired him. He lost his home because he didn't have a job. His wife couldn't handle the stress and she left him. So here he is sitting in this charitable hospital, wishing he could move his hands so that he could kill himself. Oh, my God. So I was like, oh, my God. So, I, yes. So I brought the computer, wanted nothing to do with it, turned his head and I'm talking, teaching, and he won't even look won't even acknowledge that I'm there. And we put it on a bedside table so that we can roll it right in front of him so he couldn't miss it. <clears throat> and I told the nurse, just leave it there. Don't do anything with it. So about a month later, I got a call from the head of the hospital. They said, Mr. Safko, could you please get to the hospital as quickly as possible? And uh, to prove that, I got a speeding ticket from the state police <laughs> getting to the <laughs> hospital. <laughs> so I walk in the room, his bed is empty. Now, 
working with quadriplegics, I knew that the only time their bed is empty is when they're dead because they can't take them out of the bed for any reason. So I looked at the bed. And I actually started to cry. And as I turned around to leave the room crying, he came out from behind the door in a wheelchair with an atrophied hand to shake my hand to thank me for saving his life. You had me. That was it. Oh, my God. Lon, what a story. Hand of God. Boy, you know what? That's what I did for the next decade and a half of my life. Why wouldn't you? (laughs) I mean, how many, I wonder how many of my listeners feel like the innovations that they're making of new and improved Tide or (laughs) Tide (laughs) Pods. Right. Well, that's a revelation, but, but you know, that, that really has an impact is such a game changer. And we don't, sometimes we don't even know how far out our innovations impact people, but you got to see it firsthand. I did. And it, it, the funny thing is, I, I was listening to John Cleese recently, and he said, how do you make God laugh? Tell him your plans. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's absolutely true, because that's not what I was planning on doing with my life. But mm-hmm. I couldn't do anything else at that point. And I got a customer in the Apple store, and my secretary says, Mr. Safko, could you please take this call? And I said, you know that I never take calls when I'm a customer. Customers always come first. She goes, I think you better take this one. I said, okay. So I walk over. I said, I'm with a customer. Can we make this fast? Who is this? He goes, John Scully. John Scully. And I said, come (laughs) on, who is this really? Stop screwing around. Literally, that's what I said to him. He says, no, this is John Scully, the CEO of Apple. He says, and his words were, what the hell are you doing using our computers, saving people's lives? And the following Monday, I was at Apple's headquarters with one of my computers to show them. And I became a, uh, a partner with Apple. Wow crazy. Wow. <laughs> yeah. What is John Scully doing now? Uh, <laughs> Probably still chasing women. Oh, did I say that out, is that out loud? <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. Wow. So, okay. So we've learned a couple of things, right? We've learned a couple of things that a, our innovations can have a massive impact B that we need to understand that incremental in- innovation is not secondary to the moonshot right? Everybody's looking for like the game changer. But the reality is that us humans need baby steps in order for us to eventually take the leap. Yeah. And the other is that the story that connects us is the breadcrumbs that allows the human to actually understand what's coming without fear. And a lot of really scary chemical processes going on inside of our brains and our guts. We're learning more and more that so much of these neurotransmitters are happening in our tummies. Right. There where you go, I don't want that. <laughs> and when it is that visceral, it becomes very hard to change somebody's mind. You're so right. Nobody who talks about innovation looks at that perspective, but it's so real. And it's the major block, the major thing that keeps us innovators from being successful. When I teach entrepreneurship, I said, if you build a better mousetrap, the world will be the path to your door. And I said, if you don't have a good story and know how to sell and market, you'll just end up with more dead mice. Yeah. And lots of and and hefty storage fees for all of your mouse traps. <laughs> so I want to shift the conversation a little sure. bit to your publishing career, which is vast and deep and beloved by so many people who follow the social media Bible and figuring out how to make these connections because you are a person who sees things into the future. Um Tell us a little bit about the impetus for writing those books. It now seems like social media is such a part of our lives, like, duh, but we needed a Bible back then to actually help guide us through the process. So tell us about the impetus for that and what you hope to achieve with it at the time. When was that published? Well, the first book that I published actually was How to Build Your New Home in No Time and How to Work with Contractors. In 2003, after the dot bomb, we saw what happened to the internet. The investors pulled out of almost everything that was going on on the internet, dot bomb. And I said, they're going to put their money somewhere. They're going to put it into real estate. And we're going to enter the largest residential home building craze in the history of humans. And I probably should have changed that story and been less hyperbole, but that's the way I felt about it. And nobody listened to me. So I went to, uh, Pearson Publishing. And I said, we need to do a book on this because we're going to. And I repeated that. And I was lucky enough to have a editor 
who listened to the story and believed what I was saying. So in 2005, my book came out, How to Build Your New House in No Time. Well, guess what happened in 2005, six, seven, all the way up to 2008. So I was ahead of this, the curve again, and I was lucky enough to have an editor at Pearson that recognized that. So in 2006, I was looking at something, I think it was called Web 2.0, maybe. And nobody knew what it was. Nobody knew what to call it, but it was make, it was changing the way we use the internet. So I went back to Pearson and I said, first of all, it's not Web 2.0. It's going to be called social media. And we need to do the biggest, fastest book to get to market. And they said, we're not going to touch that. Social media is a fad. It's got no substance. A year from now, nobody's even going to remember what that was. And I said, uh-uh. So they wouldn't touch it. So I went over to John Wiley and Sons, and because I had a previous su- su- success, they at least listened to the pitch. And they said, we think you might be onto something. So they wrote the contract in 07 in March of 08. I published it, but was made it unique is I wanted it to be everything that I had learned. I was already teaching SEO, SEM, teaching websites. I was considered um, an email marketing expert. And nobody's, everybody said, email mark, email has nothing to do with social media. Yeah, it does. Because what differentiated social media from everything else that was being done on the internet was two-way communication. It changed from a monologue to a dialogue. Right. And that is what really changed everything. And Wiley looked at it. And March of 2008, I published the first edition of it. And it was 850 pages. Oh, my God. Yeah. And if you know anything about a diminishing attention span as a result of social media. <laughs> that our the cool ability- thing is you can jump from chapter to chapter and it was organized in such a way you can read the intro and that would tell you what it was. But if you wanted to know more, you can go deeper. The structure of the book was really critical because I knew that was going to be a problem. And I also designed it so that it would be a textbook and that it was going to be 18 months behind universities or at least 18 months to two years behind the whole rest of the world. And sure enough, right about 18 months, universities all over the world picked it up. And that's why we ended up doing uh, three editions. And uh, it sold over $2 million in copies, which I didn't get. John Wiley was a very good negotiator. Ah, gotcha. Yeah, that's a whole other show is Innovation. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I was a new author, so I didn't realize. What about your latest book now? Oh, the latest one, yes, (laughs) self-published, because I did learn. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. And that's actually pretty big for a business book. It's 350 pages called the Innovative Thinking Bible, and it's, Everything that I've gathered and accumulated and all of my thoughts and all my processes and examples of innovative thinking. I mean, I've been building this for over 20 years. And finally, I said, it's time. That's what I want to focus on. I want to help people be more creative, more innovative. I even came up with a formula. It's a three-step thing that you can follow, which will make you more creative and innovative. And about a, I guess it was about a year ago, it came out. And that one actually hit number one on Amazon in three categories and stayed there for three weeks. Wow. So that's powerful. And so is that where people can find your books, Ron? Yeah, Amazon. There's uh, 22. (laughs) 22 of my books are on Amazon. So when you're not busy, like reinventing the planet, you're just writing books about how to do it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, kind (laughs) of. Yes. Amazing. Just prolific. Okay. So now I'm going to put you on the hot seat. Wait, actually, Uh before I get to the hot seat, tell me about that picture of the Titanic behind you. (laughs) Well, it's an open to my career. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> one day you're sailing ahead and you're drinking champagne <laughs> next day you're jumping into ice cold water yeah I, it, i'm not a titaniac or a collector i don't have spoons or salt shakers or <laughs> <laughs> hummels <laughs> What happened was I had built the model of the Titanic because I was telling my daughter, I'd read some books on it before anybody knew what it was back in the uh, early 90s. Nobody cared. So, But the stories that were going on inside that whole scenario were so fascinating to me, Mm. the rich and the poor and the hubris. And so I was telling my daughter, I was about eight years old, and we built this model. Well, not together. I ended up building it. And so we, she kind of got into it with me. And then Bollard had just discovered where the Titanic lay in the North Atlantic. That was cool. And they were going to, James Cameron was going to do a movie about the Titanic. I thought, wow, that's kind of cool. So what I did was, is I contacted Harlan and Wolf, the actual builders of the Titanic. And I said, do you have any design documents from the Titanic? And he said, sure. 
<laughs> so I actually was able to buy the architectural rendering of the Titanic from wow. them for five bucks. Honest to goodness, I couldn't believe it myself. And that's framed behind me. So I had that. And then a French company went down to the actual Titanic. And when they were pulling up coal from the bunker before wow. they made it against the law. So I bought a hunk and stuck it on my shelf. That's right up here on my shelf. And I was like, wow, that's all cool. And I really wanted to see that at Titanic, the Cameron was building because I heard stories, but it was top secret. Everybody had to sign oh. non-disclosures. So I'm checking every day on the internet to try to find out. And I'm thinking, he's not in LA. You can't hide the Titanic in Long Beach. And he's not, <laughs> he's not San Francisco and, and going up and down the coast. And it's like, there's no way that he's going to hide the Titanic off the U.S. Pacific coast. So there's one day, there's one photograph was snuck out where all you can see was just the smokestacks over this warehouse. And there was one car in the parking lot. It was taken by a, a guard down there. And I brought it in, zoomed down to the pixel level, and I was able to see black and white license plate. Baja, Mexico. They're in Rosarita. So I got in my car with my daughter and we headed across the Mexican border and I'll be a son of a gun. There was the Titanic. It, they were breaking it apart. And I, it was a Sunday, so there was nobody there. So I paid the guard 20 bucks to not only let me in, but I was able to go into the first class cabin and walk the, the hallway outside and get pictures. I, it was the funniest thing. So now I got this pictures. I got a handful of the bolts, the nuts and bolts. They were all made out of fiberglass and just hot glued onto the plywood. So as they're busting it apart, millions of these things fell into the parking lot. So I scooped up a bunch of those. So now I've got this kind of collection. And my wife is an artist. And she says, what if I painted you a painting of it for your office? And I said, I would love that. So she did. And there it is. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Incredible. So another crazy story. It's a great story. It's a phenomenal story. So okay. we got stories. You and I got, have no shortage of stories. We got some stories for sure. <laughs> so, okay. Time for the hot seat question. Okay. So if you could join any innovation team throughout human history, which team would you join? Well, that is a hot seat question because, oh my goodness. Wow. I mean, you'd want to pick like Thomas Edison over at Menlo Park or Einstein on the Manhattan Project, or, I mean, there's so many things that come to mind. I mean, even Newton, when he's breaking apart light and stuff, holy, for me, being a technoid, I, even though I know it would have been horrible, I think I would have liked to work with Jobs when he broke away from Apple and hung the pirate flag over the three-story house behind Apple and uh, declared war on Wozniak and the Apple II. He took his 21 best engineers and he worked on, he created the Macintosh. Yeah, because that happened in my lifetime. I watched it. Yeah, I would like to have been part of that. I would like to have my signature on the inside of the first Mac. Oh, yeah, that's sexy. I'll give you that. Okay, <laughs> so greatest innovation of all time. Ooh. You could choose a couple if you like. That's Again, that's a tough one. You can say the wheel and you can say fire and you can see some of the basic things. You can say penicillin or we'd probably all be dead by now. So, I mean, <laughs> there's light, electric light, electricity. Again, being a tech heavily influenced by the computer because I have never, we as a human species, have never seen one single invention that has changed society in as many ways and as profoundly as the computer did. Or is it the internet, which will could potentially render this device of a computer obsolete or reinvent it altogether? Absolutely. But see, I, I try to stick to one. Yes, the internet definitely would be the second one. There's no question about it. Yeah. Yes. And the pairing of those two, it changed the world in ways that we never could see. And, and we still don't even know a tenth of what it's going to change. Peanut butter and jelly. That's <laughs> that changed the world, too. That's right. Chocolate and peanut butter. All good combos. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And finally, if you could, if you think about one thing that annoys the hell out of you, an innovation that you'd love to see that doesn't exist right now, what do you think that would be? Oh, these are really tough. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you don't call it the hot seat for nothing, Long. <laughs> <laughs> wow. What annoys the hell out of me? Uh, see people in general. Innovated? I've been called the social media expert. Huh? What does that mean? 
I like persons, but sometimes I'm not fond of, I could do a presentation in front of 20,000 people and I have, but the after party, I usually sneak back to the room. <laughs> and so what is that innovation then that you're looking for? Yeah, and that's not the thing that ticks me off the most. That's because I'm on the spectrum. All of us innovators are on the spectrum. We're somewhere, we're on the positive side. So we don't have any acronyms that describe what we do. And we don't have any medications that make us less productive. That's probably a good thing. <laughs> we're equally on there. Wow, that's a good one. Or something well, that's going off. <laughs> that you'd love to see made greater. Honest to goodness, I think... Just to follow that same trend, I want to see what I'd love to live long enough just to see what we continue to do with the Internet. And I'm not a big fan of social media platforms. If Facebook folded up completely today, I would open a bottle of champagne. Mm. I don't care for them. They evolved from being, in my opinion, only in my opinion, from something useful for humans to communicate to total nonsense. As a matter of fact, I've been on the warpath all week with people on LinkedIn posting cats and parrots, and it, that doesn't doesn't belong on LinkedIn, and you're destroying the platform. But mm-hmm. I want to see. Uh, did you ever hear the? You got to do his interview, Jonathan Sackier. He invented the computer and a robot that you could be in Los Angeles, and he's in London. And as a heart surgeon, he could do open heart surgery on you using the robot from London. Yes. It's like the equivalent of drone attacks, right? From sitting in Alexandria, you can wage war in a cubicle in in Alexandria. Any place in the world. And yesterday they did it. There was a science article about they just did an open heart, uh, no, a heart transplant on a pig. Right. But there was no doctor in the room. Nobody was connected. The, The AI built into the surgery robot was smart enough to handle the entire operation itself. And I sent him that article yesterday, and then he sent me an email back this morning. We had this incredible conversation about how technology is just blowing up in every possible way. And that's what I want to see. I, I, if I could live 50 more years, it would only be to see what we as the human race can do to better ourselves just using computer technology and internet technology. I love it. Well, um, I'll see you in the next 50 because healthcare is going to wind up evolving um, to the point where why wouldn't we have another 50 ahead of us? Absolutely. For better or for worse. (laughs) Jeff Bezos is putting billions into his new research company, billions, and hired the the woman who co-invented CRISPR. Right. Amazing. Amazing. Well, if you want to put us in touch, we'd love to have him on the show. So that would be phenomenal. But Lon, thank you so much for joining me today. And where can people find you? To no, just safco.com or lonsafco.com. Fantastic. We'll put it in the show notes. Thank you Amazon so much. Too. <laughs> yeah. Or on Amazon, buy all 22 of the books on Amazon. You would be my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't want one of those? Lon, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's been an honor. <laughs> Likewise. Now you might be asking, Susan, why innovation storytelling? Well, the truth is that an innovation story told well not only breaks down communication barriers so you can drive change and new growth, but it also helps other people remember and champion your work. And it propels your best ideas forward faster to secure you the runway, resources, and recognition you so richly deserve. In other words, stories are memory-making devices that significantly reduce the time it takes for you and your innovation to be understood. But like many leaders, you probably never got the memo that storytelling skills would be central to your success. Well, I've got some good news for you. It's not too late because I've got you covered. Whether you need an expert to come and speak to your innovation leaders, you need training in the art and method of innovation storytelling, or you just need the support and guidance of a consultant who can get you where you want to go in less time, visit www.susanlinder.com today to learn more and to set up a call to discuss your needs. I'm so looking forward to connecting with you and to helping you tell a great innovation story. If you like what you heard so far, don't forget to subscribe so you never miss another episode. And leave us a comment. Tell us what you think of this episode. We'd love to hear from you. And if you didn't like what you've heard, just forget everything I've said.